Right, well, thank you very much for coming to this session and thank you very much um, for inviting me. Uh, so my talk is going to look at the ecological impacts of these species on the move and in particular, you know, what, um, how important are species interactions and, and their effects of climate on, on these species interactions. Now, this is a relatively young field. We don't know a lot about um, the effects of climate on species interactions, but the first kind of synthesis studies are starting to come out. Um, this is a study by Nancy Ockendon uh, from 2014, and what they showed here was that when they looked at long time series, um, so studies with more than 20 years of duration, and they related um, the population time series to some sort of climate metric, what they found was that the, in terms of looking at the proximate mechanisms that could underpin the relationship between climate and some sort of demographic metric like abundance or productivity, it was actually changes to the way species interact that most influenced um, the outcome. So for example, we see here um, that changes in predation uh, were the most um, important in terms of causing uh, a change in the demography. However, this study was only um, based on terrestrial and freshwater species. Um, there was no marine species. So the case that I will put forward here is that these climate-mediated effects on species interactions would be even greater if they, were, uh, if they had included marine systems. And this is for a few reasons. One of them is that top-down control in general is a lot more important in the sea than it is on land. Um, also, um, marine species, as we've heard um, many times in the conference, are moving a lot faster in the ocean than they are on land. And what I'm going to say is that these climate-mediated impacts on species interactions will be even greater when they impact habitat-forming species. So let me introduce you um, to some of the main habitat-forming species in marine systems. Here are the coral reefs that dominate healthy um, tropical ecosystems. And these systems are characterized by being dominated by animals and by having very high levels of herbivory. There's um, tropical herbivorous fish make up the you know, the biggest part of the fish biomass in these systems and they're constantly grazing and constantly eating the, the algae that could otherwise overtake the corals. Now, if this herbivory decreases, um, the system shifts in a very fundamental way from being dominated by corals to being dominated by, uh, by algae in some systems. Now, in temperate systems, it's actually the opposite. The main habitat forming organisms here are the kelps. They provide habitat for hundreds of species, and the problem we have it here when herbivory increases, for example, through overfishing of top predators. And then the system shifts from, from complex, uh, structurally complex, very diverse and productive kelp forest to the pauperate uh, barrens dominated by urchins. So my research kind of looks at w what are the ecological impacts of tropical herbivorous fish that dominate in the tropics when they're starting to intrude into temperate systems. Now, <coughs> these kind of range extensions are going to happen, especially in a number of hot spots where ocean currents push tropical species into temperate places, you know, like places like Tasmania, but also places like Japan, where the Kuroshio current um, does the same as the Istosurian current, but, but on the opposite direction, etc. So a group of us got together and did a review paper looking at, okay, in these hot spots where warming is happening faster than the global mean, and we have this tropical water coming into temperate places, you know, what evidence is there that tropical herbivorous fish are extending the ranges? And we did find evidence for quite a number of species that are moving um, towards temperate reefs. And we did find ecological impacts in a number of places, in southeastern Japan, the east and west coast of Australia, uh, Florida and the Mediterranean. Possibly the most photogenic and extreme example of, of what I call tropicalization uh, happened in the south coast of Japan in a place called Tosa Bay. It used to be dominated by kelp in the 1990s. Um, by the late 1990s, these kelp forests uh, were overgrazed by fish. And then by 2000, it was a complete barren. And in 2013, it was largely dominated by fast-growing Acropora corals. I was there in 2014, and this is what it looks like. So it's been a full kind of tropicalization of the system. Now, what do we lose when we lose um, this kelp? Um, well, we lose all the species that associate with them, and amongst them are economically important species like abalone. So this is from the same uh, place in Japan, Tosa Bay, and we can see how the abalone fishery completely collapsed um, as a result of the kelp disappearing. So what's happening in eastern Australia? Um, we know that the fish are, uh, tropical fish are intruding temperate waters. 
people like David Booth and Will Figuera here in this conference have um, been working on this for decades. And we know that the proportion of herbivores amongst fish populations is increasing. This is data from Amanda Bates and colleagues here in Tasmania. And we can see how there's been a, a, a gradual increase in the proportion of herbivorous fish in, in fish communities. Now, in Sydney, this is what we're finding at the moment. We're finding tropical herbivorous fish that come kind of around now, and they're starting to appear, and they become quite numerous, quite abundant, but then they tend to die in, in, in the winter because the temperature is too cold, um, presumably. Now, an honor student of mine, Alex Basford, looked at what are these guys doing when they come to Sydney? Um, uh, what do they feed on, and do they feed the same as you know, equivalent species from warm temperate areas? So he did um, a bunch of um, aquaria feeding experiments with tropical um, fish and with the, the closest relative in the warm temperate system that naturally occur there. So we compared Acanthura species with Prionura species and we looked at their feeding on naturally occurring turf algae um, in an experimental setup in aquaria. Now, what Alex found was that the tropical surgeon fish consume a lot more algae than the warm temperate um, equivalents. And this is both at you know, 20 degrees or a warmer 25 degrees temperature settings. Importantly, there's one species of these warm temperate vagrants, uh, sorry, tropical vagrants, that is particularly voracious and particularly seems to target the brown algal recruits of the species that would make the forest. So that's one to look out for. So we know that the fish are moving, we know that they're feeding in their new range at higher rates than the local species, but is there any evidence that the kelp is disappearing? To look at this, um, I went to northern New South Wales, um, to a place called the Solitary Islands. Um, here's uh, what the water temperature is doing over a long time scale from the 1950s, so there's been definite warming here. And this is um, data from 2002 until present time can see how there's been a gradual uh, warming of about 0 0.6 degrees. During this time, there has been an increase in the proportion of tropical herbivorous fish. And during this time, there has been a decline and eventual disappearance of kelp forests. Um, we, we've seen this from you looking at uh, baited remote underwater videos. Um, and we basically used the videos and whether there was kelp present or, <coughs> or absent behind those videos. So Besides being able to score present absence of kelp, we could also see whether the kelp was actually had obvious signs of fish grazing or not by looking at whether they had bite marks. And we can see how the proportion of kelp that had clear signs of grazing increased um, as the kelp disappeared. So yes, the kelp forests are disappearing. Now, besides temperature, um, I want to finish up by just talking about the kind of biological mechanisms that could be facilitating uh, the decline of kelp. There's two kind of big things that I think we need to take into account, and they, they relate to the functional differences between tropical and temperate taxa. In terms of the herbivores, we know that tropical herbivores um, tend to be a lot more diverse in their feeding. Some species focus on eating the small stuff, some species eating on, you know, eat the bigger kind of macroalgae, and together they can really denude the bottom of all seaweeds. But what I'd like to focus on now is the functional differences between the prey, the tropical and the temperate uh, macrophytes. Um, how do they differ in nutritional quality? How do they differ in phenology? And can, can that have an effect on uh, that results in this decline of kelp forests? The reason why I think nutrition squa nutritious quality, nutritional quality of the, of the temperate algae may be a factor is because we know that, for example, nitrogen content tends to increase with latitude. So this is data um, that incorporates 1,400 macrophytes, and we can see that in both in all terrestrial freshwater and marine systems, um, the content of nitrogen is much higher, the higher latitude that you go in. So if you're a herbivore and you take one bite of a high latitude plant, you're getting in more nitrogen than if you take the same bite of a tropical species. To test the hypothesis that temperate macrophytes are more nutritious or palatable, uh, we did an experiment in, in southern Japan, in Tosabe, the same place that I showed you earlier, and we compared feeding amongst six uh, species, three of them tropical, three of, three of them temperate, and they kind of co occur in this area because it's a tropical temperate transition zone. Now, what we found when we did these experiments in the early summer was that there wasn't really any, dif any difference in feeding that was related to tropical versus temperate. The fish like all the tropical species and one of the temperate species, 
Um, this wasn't related to the nitrogen content. In fact, the species that they least consume were the highest in nitrogen. What we did find though that was that there was a very strong relationship between the feeding um, and the phenolic content of the, of the macrophytes, and that's the secondary metabolites that are known to deter some herbivores at least. So essentially the fish were consuming those species that had <coughs> less phenolics. Now, this is interesting. Um, it, it disputes the, 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 the idea that nitrogen matters, at least in these tropical temperate transition zones. But the thing that really surprised us here was that the, the kelp, the clonia cava, was actually the least consumed of all the species. Now, this is the one that we know is disappearing. We know that grazing has something to do with it. So how come it, was, you know, it wasn't very targeted? So we've repeated the, the same experiment, but later on in the autumn, and we found that in this instance, all feeding was concentrated on this kelp. And the reason for that was that there was no thing else around. So all the other species that we had worked with were actually um, ephemeral species that disappeared midsummer. So phenology does matter. Kelps get overgrazed because they're the main perennial species that, that you know, s sus are sustained um, in the warmer late summer and autumn months. Now, to just finish up, this is not the first time that we're seeing this kind of rise in, temp in herbivory um, associated with warmer temperatures. This is data from the fossil record from Jessica Bloas and, and, and colleagues. And um, they looked at the fossil record across the Paleocene, Eocene, thermal maximum. They saw that there's warming associated with increases in CO2, and that <coughs> was related with an increase in the intensity and the frequency of herbivory. Um, now, this increasing herbivory and this warming um, resulted in, in novel and transitory species assemblages and this is what I think we're dealing with in places like the solitary islands. And these novel e ecosystems are going to be more and more common. Now the thing about this is that they're actually, you know, transitory means, you know, they can last, you know, 2,000 years at least in this example. So we really need to get a better handle on, on how these things work. So I'll just finish up by posing a number of questions. Um, some of these questions are actually the focus of the talks that follow in this section, and, and they just kind of point to the things that I think we, we need to be uh, thinking about. You know, what are the drivers of changes in species interactions other than temperature that result in novel communities? How can we incorporate all this information into species distribution models? Very importantly, what are the food implications, the food security implications of this, and, and how can we manage these novel um, species assemblages better? And I'll just finish by thanking my many collaborators, in particular Dr. Hamish Malcolm from the Solitary Islands Marine Park and Yoji Nakamura from Japan.